Dramatis Personae of All's Well That Ends Well. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae of All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare. Bertram, Count of Rossillon. Read by David Nicol. Clown, Servant to the Countess. Read by Dennis Sayers. Countess, Mother to Bertram. Read by Ruth Golding. Diana, Daughter to the Widow. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Duke of Florence. Read by Robert Fletcher. First Gentleman. Read by Brett Downey. First Lord. Read by Bologna Times. First Soldier. Read by O123. Fourth Lord. Read by Levi Throckmorton. Helena, a gentlewoman protected by the Countess. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. King of France. Read by Andy Minter. La Fieu, an old lord. Read by Martin Giessen. Mariana, neighbor and friend to the widow. Read by Maria Therese. Page. Read by Lucy Perry. Parolles, a follower of Bertram. Read by M. B. Second Gentleman. Read by Martin Outen. Second Lord. Read by David Goldfarb. Second Soldier. Read by Vicente. Servant. Read by Lucy Perry. Steward. Servant to the Countess. Read by Levi Throckmorton. Widow. An old widow of Florence. Read by Musical Heart One. Narrated by Avaí. End of Dramatis Personae. Act One of All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare. Act One, Scene One. Rossillon, the Count's Palace. Enter Bertram, the Countess of Rossillon, Helena, and La Fieu all in black in delivering my son from me i bury a second husband and i in going mother weep o'er my father's death anew but i must attend his majesty's command to whom i am now in ward evermore in subjection you shall find of the king a husband madam you sir a father he that so generally is at all times good must of necessity hold his virtue to you whose worthiness would stir it up where it wanted rather than lack it where there is such abundance what hope is there of his majesty's amendment he hath abandoned his physicians madam under whose practices he hath persecuted time with hope and finds no other advantage in the process but only the losing of hope by time this young gentlewoman had a father oh that had how sad a passage tis whose skill was almost as great as his honesty had it stretched so far, would have made nature immortal, and death should have play for lack of work. Would, for the king's sake, he were living, I think it would be the death of the king's disease. How call it you the man you speak of, madam? He was famous, sir, in his profession, and it was his great right to be so, Gerard de Narbonne. He was excellent indeed, madam. The king very lately spoke of him admiringly and mourningly. He was skilful enough to have lived still, if knowledge could be set up against mortality. What is it, my good lord, the king languishes of? A fistula, my lord. I heard not of it before i would it were not notorious was this gentlewoman the daughter of gerard de narbonne his sole child my lord and bequeathed to my overlooking 
I have those hopes of her good that her education promises. Her disposition she inherits which makes fair gifts fairer. For where an unclean mind carries virtuous qualities, their commendations go with pity. They are virtues and traitors too. In her they are the better for their simpleness. She derives her honesty and achieves her goodness. Your commendations, madam, get from her tears. Tis the best brine a maiden can season her praise in. The remembrance of her father never approaches her heart, but the tyranny of her sorrows takes all livelihood from her cheek. No more of this, Helena, go to, no more, lest it be rather thought you affect a sorrow than have it. I do affect a sorrow indeed, but I have it too. Moderate lamentation is the right of the dead, excessive grief the enemy to the living. If the living be enemy to the grief, the excess makes it soon mortal. Madam, I desire your holy wishes. How understand we that? Be thou blessed, Bertram, and succeed thy father in manners as in shape. Thy blood and virtue contend for empire in thee, and thy goodness share with thy birthright. Love all, trust a few, do wrong to none. Be able for thine enemy rather in power than use, and keep thy friend under thy own life's key. Be checked for silence, but never taxed for speech. What heaven more will that thee may furnish, and my prayers pluck down, fall on thy head. Farewell, my lord, tis an unseasoned courtier, good my lord, advise him. He cannot want the best that shall attend his love. Heaven bless him. Farewell, Bertram. Exit. To Helena. The best wishes that can be forged in your thoughts be servants to you. Be comfortable to my mother your mistress, and make much of her. Farewell, pretty lady. You must hold the credit of your father. Exeunt Bertram and La Fieu. Oh, were that all! I think not on my father, and these great tears grace his remembrance more than those I shed for him. What was he like? I have forgot him. My imagination carries no favourite but Bertram's. I am undone. There is no living, none, if Bertram be away. T'were all one that I should love a bright particular star, and think to wed it, he is so above me. In his bright radiance and collateral light must I be comforted, not in his sphere. The ambition in my love thus plagues itself. The hind that would be mated by the lion must die for love. T'was pretty, though plague, to see him every hour, to sit and draw his arched brows, his hawking eye, his curls in our heart's table, heart too capable of every line and trick of his sweet favour. But now he's gone, and my idolatrous fancy must sanctify his reliquies. Who comes here? Enter Parolles. Aside. One that goes with him. I love him for his sake. And yet I know him a notorious liar, think him a great way fool, solely a coward. Yet these fixed evils sit so fit in him that they take place when virtue's steely bones look bleak o' the cold wind. Withal full oft we see cold wisdom waiting on superfluous folly. Save you, fair queen. And you, monarch? No. And no. Are you meditating on virginity? Ay, you have some stain of soldier in you. Let me ask you a question. Man is enemy to virginity. How may we barricado it against him? Keep him out. But he assails, and our virginity, though valiant in the defence, yet is weak. Unfold to us some warlike resistance. 
There is none. Man, sitting down before you, will undermine you and blow you up. Bless our poor virginity from underminers and blowers up. Is there no military policy how virgins might blow up men? Virginity being blown down, man will quicklier be blown up. Mary, in blowing him down again with the breach yourselves made, you lose your city. It is not politic in the commonwealth of nature to preserve virginity. Loss of virginity is rational increase, and there was never virgin got till virginity was first lost. That you were made of is metal to make virgins. Virginity, by being once lost, may be ten times found. By being ever kept, it is ever lost. Tis too cold a companion. Away with it. I will stand for to little, though therefore I die a virgin. There's little can be said in. Tis against the rule of nature. To speak on the part of virginity is to accuse your mothers, which is most infallible disobedience. He that hangs himself is a virgin. Virginity murders itself and should be buried in highways out of all sanctified limit as a desperate offendress against nature. Virginity breeds mites much like a cheese, consumes itself to the very paring, and so dies with feeding his own stomach. Besides, virginity is peevish, proud, idle, made of self-love, which is the most inhibited sin in the canon. Keep it not. You cannot choose but lose by it. Out with it. Within ten year it will make itself ten, which is a goodly increase, and the principle itself not much the worse. Away with it. How might one do, sir, to lose it to her own liking? Let me see. Mary, ill, to like him that ne'er it likes. Tis a commodity will lose the gloss with lying. The longer kept, the less worth. Off with it, while tis vendable. Answer the time of request. Virginity, like an old courtier, wears her cap out of fashion. Richly suited, but unsuitable, just like the brooch and the toothpick, which wear not now. Your date is better in your pie and your porridge than in your cheek. And your virginity, your old virginity, is like one of our French withered pears. It looks ill, it eats dryly. Mary, tis a withered pear. It was formerly better. Mary, yet tis a withered pear. Will you anything with it? Not my virginity, yet. There shall your master have a thousand loves, a mother and a mistress and a friend, a phoenix captain and an enemy, a guide, a goddess, and a sovereign, a counsellor, a traitress, and a dear. His humble ambition, proud humility, his jarring concord and his discord dulcet, his faith, his sweet disaster, with a world of pretty, fond, adoptious Christendoms that blinking Cupid gossips. Now shall he—I know not what he shall. God send him well. The court's a learning place, and he is one— What one, if faith? That I wish well. Tis pity. What's pity? That wishing well had not a body in't which might be felt. That we, the poorer born, whose baser stars do shut us up in wishes, might with effects of them follow our friends, and show what we alone must think, which never return us thanks. Enter page. Monsieur Parolles, my lord calls for you. Exit. Ah, little Helen, farewell. If I can remember thee, I will think of thee at court. Monsieur Parolles, you were born under a charitable star. Under Mars, I. I especially think under Mars. Why under Mars? The wars have so kept you under that you must needs be born under Mars. When he was predominant? Mm, when he was retrograde, I think, rather. Uh, why think you so? You go so much backward when you fight. That's for advantage. <laughs> so is running away when fear proposes the safety. But the composition that your valour and fear makes in you is a virtue of a good wing, and I like the wear well. I, I am so full of business, I cannot answer thee acutely. I will return perfect courtier. 
in the which my instruction shall serve to naturalize thee so thou wilt be capable of a courtier's counsel and understand what advice shall thrust upon thee else thou diest in thy unthankfulness and thine ignorance makes thee away farewell though when thou hast leisure say thy prayers when thou hast none remember thy friends and get thee a good husband and use him as he uses thee so farewell exit our remedies oft in ourselves do lie which we ascribe to heaven the fated sky gives us free scope only doth backward pull our slow designs when we ourselves are dull what power is it which mounts my love so high that makes me see and cannot feed mine eye the mightiest space in fortune nature brings to join like likes and kiss like native things impossible be strange attempts to those that weigh their pains and sense and do suppose what hath been cannot be whoever strove so show her merit that did miss her love the king's disease my project may deceive me but my intents are fixed and will not leave me exit scene two paris the king's palace flourish of cornets enter the king of france with letters and diverse attendants the florentines and senois are by the ears have fought with equal fortune and continue a braving war so tis reported sir nay tis most credible we here received it a certainty vouched from our cousin austria with caution that the florentine will move us for speedy aid wherein our dearest friend prejudicates the business and would seem to have us make denial his love and wisdom approve so to your majesty may plead for amplest credence he hath armed our answer and florence is denied before he comes yet for our gentlemen that mean to see the tuscan service freely have they leave to stand on either part it well may serve a nursery to our gentry who are sick for breathing an exploit what's he comes here Enter Bertram, Lafeu, and Parolles. It is the Count Rosalan, my good lord, young Bertram. Youth, thou bearest thy father's face. Frank nature, rather curious than in haste, hath well composed thee. Thy father's moral parts mayst thou inherit too. Welcome to Paris. My thanks and duty are your majesties. I would I had that corporal soundness now, as when thy father and myself in friendship first tried our soldiership. He did look far into the service of the time, and was discipled of the bravest. He lasted long, but on us both did haggish age steal on and wore us out of act. It much repairs me to talk of your good father. In his youth he had the wit which I can well observe to-day in our young lords, but they may jest till their own scorn return to them unnoted ere they can hide their levity in honour so like a courtier contempt nor bitterness were in his pride or sharpness if they were his equal had awaked them and his honour clock to itself knew the true minute when exception bid him speak and at this time his tongue obeyed his hand who were below him he used as creatures of another place and bowed his eminent top to their low ranks, making them proud of his humility. In their poor praise he humbled. Such a man might be a copy to these younger times, which, followed well, would demonstrate them now, but goes backward. His good remembrance, sir, lies richer in your thoughts than on his tomb. So, in a proof, lives not his epitaph as in your royal speech. Would I were with him! He would always say, methinks I hear him now, his plausive words he scattered not in ears, but grafted them, to grow there and to bear. Let me not live. This his good melancholy oft began, on the catastrophe and healed of pastime, when it was out. Let me not live, quoth he, after my flame lacks oil, to be the snuff of younger spirits, whose apprehensive senses all but new things disdain whose judgments are mere fathers of their garments, 
whose constancies expire before their fashions. This he wished, I after him do after him wish too, since I nor wax nor honey can bring home, I quickly were dissolved from my hive, to give some labourers room. You are loved, sir. They that least lend it you shall lack you first. I fill a place, I note. How long is't, Count, since the physician at your father's died? He was much famed. Some six months since, my lord. If he were living, I would try him yet. Lend me an arm, the rest have worn me out with several applications. Nature and sickness debate it at their leisure. Welcome, Count, my son's no dearer. Thank your majesty. Exeunt. Flourish. Scene three. Rossillon, the Count's palace. Enter Countess, Steward, and Clown. I will now hear what say you of this gentlewoman. Madam, the care I have had to even your content I wish might be found in the calendar of my past endeavours, for then we wound our modesty and make foul the clearness of our deservings when of ourselves we publish them. What does this knave here? Get you gone, sirrah. The complaints I have heard of you I do not all believe. Tis my slowness that I do not. For I know you lack not folly to commit them, and have ability enough to make such knavery as yours. Tis not unknown to you, madam. I am a poor fellow. Well, sir. No, madam, tis not so well that I am poor, though many of the rich are damned. But if I may have your ladyship's good will to go to the world, Isbel the woman and I will do as we may. Wilt thou needs be a beggar? I do beg your good will in this case. In what case? In Isbel's case, and mine own. Service is no heritage, and I think I shall never have the blessing of God till I have issue of my body. For they say, bairns are blessings. Tell me thy reason why thou wilt marry. My poor body, madam, requires it. I am driven on by the flesh, and he must needs go, that the devil drives. Is this all your worship's reason? Faith, madam, I have other holy reasons, such as they are. May the world know them. I have been, madam, a wicked creature, as you and all flesh and blood are, and indeed I do marry, that I may repent. Thy marriage sooner than thy wickedness. I am out of friends, madam, and I hope to have friends for my wife's sake. Such friends are thine enemies, knave. You're shallow, madam, in great friends, for the knaves come to do that for me which I am aweary of. He that ears my land spares my team, and gives me leave to in the crop. If I be his cuckold, he's my drudge. He that comforts my wife is the cherisher of my flesh and blood. He that cherishes my flesh and blood loves my flesh and blood. He that loves my flesh and blood is my friend, ergo. He that kisses my wife is my friend. If men could be contented to be what they are, there were no fear in marriage, for young Charbon, the Puritan, and old Poisson, the Papist, how somewhere their hearts are severed in religion, their heads are both one. They may jowl horns together like any deer in the herd. Wilt thou ever be a foul-mouthed and calumnious knave? A prophet I, madam, and I speak the truth the next way. For I the ballad will repeat, which men full true shall find. Your marriage comes by destiny, your cuckoo sings by kind. Get you gone, sir, I'll talk with you more anon. May it please you, madam, that he bid Helen come to you. Of her I am to speak. Sirrah, tell my gentlewoman I would speak with her. Helen, I mean. Was this fair face the cause, quoth she, 
why the Grecians sacked Troy. Fond done, done fond, was this King Priam's joy. With that she sighed as she stood, with that she sighed as she stood, and gave this sentence then, among nine bad if one be good, among nine bad if one be good, <laughs> there's yet one good in ten. What one good in ten? You corrupt the song, sirrah. One good woman in ten, madam, which is a purifying of the song. Would God would serve the world so all the year. We'll find no fault with the tithe woman, if I were the parson. One in ten, quotha, and we might have a good woman born but one every blazing star, or at an earthquake, to mend the lottery well. A man may draw his heart out, ere a pluck one. You'll be gone, sir knave, and do as I command you. That man should be at woman's command, and yet no hurt done. Though honesty be no Puritan, yet it will do no hurt. It will wear the surplice of humility over the black gown of a big heart. I am going, forsooth. The business is for Helen to come hither. Exit. Well, now. I know, madam, you love your gentlewoman entirely. Faith, I do. Her father bequeathed her to me, and she herself, without other advantage, may lawfully make title to as much love as she finds. There is more owing her than is paid, and more shall be paid her than she'll demand. Madam, I was very late more near her than I think she wished me. Alone she was, and did communicate to herself her own words to her own ears. She thought, I dare vow for her, they touched not any stranger sense. Her matter was, she loved your son. Fortune, she said, was no goddess that had put such difference betwixt their two estates. Love no god that would not extend his might, only where qualities were level. Diane, no queen of virgins, that would suffer her poor knight surprised without rescue in the first assault, or ransom afterward. This she delivered in the most bitter touch of sorrow that e'er I heard virgin exclaim in, which I held my duty speedily to acquaint you withal. Sithence, in the loss that may happen, it concerns you something to know it. You have discharged this honestly. Keep it to yourself. Many likelihoods informed me of this before, which hung so tottering in the balance that I could neither believe nor misdoubt. Pray you leave me. Stall this in your bosom, and I thank you for your honest care. I will speak with you further anon. Exit Stuart. Enter Helena. Even so it was with me when I was young. If ever we are natures, these are ours. This thorn doth to our rose of youth rightly belong. Our blood to us, this to our blood is born. It is the show and seal of nature's truth, Where love's strong passion is impressed in youth. By our remembrances of days foregone, Such were our faults, or then we thought them none. Her eye is sick on I observe her now. What is your pleasure, madam? You know, Helen, I am a mother to you. Mine honourable mistress. Nay, a mother. Why not a mother? When I said a mother, methought you saw a serpent. What's in mother that you started it? I say I am your mother, and put you in the catalogue of those that were in womb at mine. "'Tis often seen adoption strives with nature, "'and choice breeds a native slip to us from foreign seeds. "'You ne'er oppressed me with a mother's groan, "'yet I express to you a mother's care. "'God's mercy, maiden, does it curd thy blood "'to say I am thy mother? "'What's the matter that this distempered messenger of wet the many-coloured iris rounds thine eye. Why, that you are my daughter? That I am not. I say I am your mother. 
Pardon, madam, the Count Rosilian cannot be my brother. I am from humble, he from honoured name. No note upon my parents, his all noble. My master, my dear lord he is, and I his servant live, and will his vassal die. He must not be my brother. Nor I your mother. You are my mother, madam. Would you were. So that my lord your son were not my brother. <laughs> Indeed, my mother. Or were you both our mothers, I care no more for than I do for heaven, so I were not his sister. Can't no other but I your daughter, he must be my brother. Yes, Helen, you might be my daughter-in-law. God shield you mean it not, daughter and mother so strive upon your pulse. What, pale again? My fear hath catched your fondness. Now I see the mystery of your loneliness, and find your salt tears head. Now to all sense tis gross you love my son. Invention is ashamed against the proclamation of thy passion to say thou dost not. Therefore tell me true, but tell me then tis so. For look, thy cheeks confess it the one to the other, and thine eyes see it so grossly shown in thy behaviours that in their kind they speak it. Only sin and hellish obstinacy tie thy tongue, that truth should be suspected. Speak, is it so? If it be so, you have wound a goodly clue. If it be not forswear, howe'er I charge thee, as heaven shall work in me for thine avail, tell me truly. Good madam, pardon me. Do you love my son? Your pardon, noble mistress. Love you, my son. Do not you love him, madam? Go not about. My love hath into bond whereof the world takes note. Come, come, disclose the state of your affection, for your passions have to the full appeached. Then, I confess, here on my knees before high heaven and you, that before you and next unto high heaven, I love your son. My friends were poor, but honest, so's my love. Be not offended, for it hurts not him that he is loved of me. I follow him not by any token of presumptuous suit, nor would I have him till I do deserve him, yet never know how that desert should be. I know I love in vain, strive against hope, yet in this captious and intenable sieve I still pour in the waters of my love, and lack not to lose still. Thus, Indian-like and religious in mine error, I adore the sun that looks upon his worshipper, but knows of him no more. My dearest madam, let not your hate encounter with my love for loving where you do. But if yourself, whose aged honour cites a virtuous youth, did ever in so true a flame of liking wish chastely and love dearly, that your Dian was both herself and love, O oh, then give pity to her, whose state is such that cannot choose, but lend and give where she is sure to lose, that seeks not to find that her search implies, but riddle-like lives sweetly where she dies. Had you not lately an intent? speak truly, to go to Paris. Madam, I had. Wherefore? Tell true. I will tell truth. By grace itself I swear. You know my father left me some prescriptions of rare and proved effects, such as his reading and manifest experience had collected for general sovereignty, and that he willed me in heedfullest reservation to bestow them, as notes whose faculties inclusive were more than they were in note. Amongst the rest there is a remedy, approved, set down, to cure the desperate languishings whereof the king is rendered lost. This was your motive for Paris, was it? Speak. My lord, your son made me to think of this. Else Paris and the medicine and the king had from the conversation of my thoughts haply been absent then.
But think you, Helen, if you should tender your supposed aid, he would receive it? He and his physicians are of a mind. He that they cannot help him, they that they cannot help. How shall they credit a poor unlearned virgin when the schools, embowelled of their doctrine, have left off the danger to itself? There's something in't more than my father's skill, which was the greatest of his profession, that his good receipt shall for my legacy be sanctified by the luckiest stars in heaven. And would your honour but give me leave to try success, I'll venture the well-lost life of mine on his grace's cure, by such a day and hour. Dost thou believed? Ay, madam, knowingly. Why, Helen, thou shalt have my leave and love, means and attendance, and my loving greetings to those of mine in court. I'll stay at home and pray God's blessing into thy attempt. Be gone to-morrow, and be sure of this, what I can help thee to thou shalt not miss. Excellent. End of Act One Act Two of All's Well That Ends Well. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two of All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare. Scene One Paris, the King's Palace. Flourish of cornets. Enter the king, attended with diverse young lords, taking leave for the Florentine war, Bertram and Parolles. Farewell, young lords. These warlike principles do not throw from you. And you, my lords, farewell. Share the advice betwixt you. If both gain, all the gift doth stretch itself as tis received, and is enough for both. Tis our hope, sir after well-entered soldiers, to return and find your grace in health. No, no, it cannot be. And yet my heart will not confess he owes the malady that doth my life besiege. Farewell, young lords. Whether I live or die, be you the sons of worthy Frenchmen. Let hire Italy, those baited that inherit but the fall of the last monarchy, see that you come not to woo honour, but to wed it. When the bravest questant shrinks, find what you seek, that fame may cry you loud. I say farewell. Health at your bidding, serve your majesty. Those girls of Italy, take heed of them. They say our French lack language to deny if they demand. Beware of being captives before you serve. Our hearts receive your warnings. Farewell. Come hither to me. Exit, attended. O oh, my sweet lord, that you will stay behind us. Tis not his fault, the spark. O oh, tis brave wars. Most admirable. I have seen those wars. I am commanded here, and kept a coil with too young, and the next year, and tis too early. And thy mind stand to it, boys. Steal away, bravely. I shall stay here the four-horse to a smock, creaking my shoes on the plain masonry till honour be bought up, and no sword worn but one to dance with. By heaven I'll steal away. There's honour in the theft. Commit it, Count. I am your accessory, and so farewell. I grow to you, and our parting is a tortured body. Farewell, Captain. Sweet Monsieur Parolas. Noble heroes, my sword and yours are kin. Uh, good sparks and lustrous, a word, good metals. Uh, you shall find in the regiment of the Spinei one Captain Spurio with his cicatrice, an emblem of war, here, uh, on his sinister cheek. It was this very sword entrenched it. Say to him, I live, and observe his reports for me. We shall, noble captain. Exeunt lords. Mars dote on you for his novices. What will ye do? Stay, the king. Re-enter king. Bertram and Parolles retire. To Bertram. Use a more spacious ceremony to the noble lords. You have restrained yourself within the list of too cold and adieu. Be more expressive to them, for they wear themselves in the cap of the time, 
there do muster true gait eat speak and move under the influence of the most received star and though the devil lead the measure such are to be followed after them and take a more dilated farewell and i will do so worthy fellows and like to prove most sinewy swordmen exeunt bertram and parolles enter lafew kneeling <laughs> Pardon, my lord, for me and for my tidings. I'll fee thee to stand up. Then here's a man stands that has brought his pardon. I would you had kneeled, my lord, to ask me mercy, and that at my bidding you could so stand up. I would I had, so I had broke thy pate and asked thee mercy for it. <laughs> good faith across but my good lord tis thus will you be cured of your infirmity no oh will you eat no grapes my royal fox yes but you will my noble grapes and if my royal fox could reach them i have seen a medicine that's able to breathe life into a stone quicken a rock and make you dance canary with sprightly fire and motion whose simple touch is powerful to erase king pepin nay to give great charlemagne a pen in his hand and write to her a love-line what her is this why doctor she my lord there's one arrived if you will see her now by my faith and honour if seriously i may convey my thoughts in this my light deliverance i have spoke with one that in her sex her years profession wisdom and constancy hath amazed me more than i dare blame my weakness will you see her for that is her demand and know her business that done laugh well at me now good lover bring in the admiration that we with thee may spend our wonder too or take off thine by wondering how thou tookst it nay i'll fit you and not be all day neither exit thus he his special nothing ever prologues re-enter lafew with helena nay come your ways this haste hath wings indeed nay come your ways this is his majesty say your mind to him a traitor you do look like but such traitors his majesty seldom fears i am cressid's uncle that dare leave two together <laughs> fare you well exit now fair one does your business follow us ay my good lord gerard de narbonne was my father in what he did profess well found i knew him the rather will i spare my praises towards him knowing him is enough on sped of death many receipts he gave me chiefly one which as the dearest issue of this practice and of his old experience the oily darling he bade me store up as a triple eye safer than mine own two more dear i have so and hearing your high majesty is touched with that malignant cause wherein the honour of my dear father's gift stands chief in power i come to tender it and my appliance with all bound humbleness we thank you maiden but may not be so credulous of cure when our most learned doctors leave us and the congregated college have concluded that labouring art can never ransom nature from her inaidable estate i say we must not so stain our judgment or corrupt our hope to prostitute our past cure malady to empirics or to dissever so our great self and our credit to esteem a senseless help when help past sense we deem my duty then shall pay me for my pains i will no more enforce mine office on you 
humbly entreating from your royal thoughts a modest one to bear me back again. I cannot give thee less to be called grateful. Thou thoughts to help me, and such thanks I give as one near death to those that wish him live. But what at full I know, thou knowst no part. I, knowing all my peril, thou no art. What I can do can do no hurt to try, since you set up your rest gainst remedy. He that of greatest works is finisher oft does them by the weakest minister. So holy writ in babes hath judgment shown, when judges have been babes. Great floods have flown from simple sources, and great seas have dried when miracles have by the greatest been denied. Oft expectation fails, and most oft there where most it promises, and oft it hits where hope is coldest, and despair most fits. I must not hear thee. Fare thee well, kind maid. Thy pains not used must by thyself be paid. Proffers not took, reap thanks for their reward. Inspired merit so by breath is barred. It is not so with him that all things knows, as tis with us that square our guess by shows. But most it is presumption in us, when the help of heaven we count the act of men. Dear sir, to my endeavours give consent. Of heaven, not me, make an experiment. I am not an impostor that proclaim myself against the level of mine aim. But know I think, and think I know most sure, my art is not past power, nor you past cure. Are thou so confident? Within what space hopest thou my cure? The greatest grace, lending grace, ere twice the horses of the sun shall bring their fiery torture his diurnal ring, ere twice in murk an occidental damp moist Hesperus hath quenched his sleepy lamp or four and twenty times the pilot's glass hath told the thievish minutes how they pass what is infirm from your sound part shall fly health shall live free and sickness freely die upon thy certainty and confidence what darest thou venture tax of impudence a strumpet's boldness a divulged shame traduced by odious ballads my maiden's name seared otherwise Nay, worse, if worse, extended with vilest torture, let my life be ended. Methinks in thee some blessed spirit doth speak his powerful sound within an organ weak. And what impossibility would slay in common sense, sense saves another way. Thy life is dear, for all that life can rate, worth name of life in thee hath estimate. Youth, beauty, wisdom, courage— all that happiness and prime can happy call. Thou this to hazard needs must intimate, Skill infinite or monstrous desperate. Sweet practiser, thy physic I will try, That ministers thine own death if I die. If I break time or flinch in property Of what I spoke, unpitied let me die, And well deserved, not helping, death's my fee. But if I help— what do you promise me? Make thy demand. But will you make it even? Ay, by my sceptre and my hopes of heaven. Then shalt thou give me with thy kingly hand What husband in thy power I will command. Exempted be from me the arrogance To choose from forth the royal blood of France, My low and humble name to propagate With any branch or image of thy state. But such a one— Thy vassal, whom I know is free for me to ask, thee to bestow. Here is my hand, the premises observed. Thy will by my performance shall be served. So make the choice of thine own time. For I, thy resolved patient, on thee still rely. More should I question thee, and more I must. Though more to know could not be more to trust. From whence thou camest, how tended on, but rest unquestioned welcome and undoubted blessed give me some help here ho oh, if thou proceed as high as word my deed shall match thy meed flourish exeunt scene two rossillon the count's palace enter countess and clown come on sir i shall now put you to the height of your breeding 
I will show myself highly fed and lowly taught. I know my business is but to the court. To the court? Why, what place makes you special when you put off that with such contempt, but to the court? Truly, madam, if God have lent a man any manners, he may easily put it off at court. He that cannot make a leg put off's cap, kiss his hand, and say nothing. Has neither leg, hands, lip, nor cap, and, indeed, such a fellow, to say precisely, were not for the court, but for me, I have an answer, will serve all men. Mary, that's a bountiful answer that fits all questions. It's like a barber's chair that fits all buttocks, the pin buttock, the quatch buttock, the brawn buttock, or any buttock. Will your answer serve fit to all questions? As fit as ten groats is for the hand of an attorney, as your French crown for your taffeta punk, as Tibbs rush for Tom's forefinger, as a pancake for Shrove Tuesday, a Morris for May Day, as the nail to his hole, the cuckold to his horn, as a scolding queen to a wrangling knave, as the nun's lip to the friar's mouth, nay, as the pudding to his skin. Have you, I say, an answer of such fitness for all questions? From below your duke to beneath your constable, it will fit any question. It must be an answer of most monstrous size that must fit all demands. But a trifle neither, in good faith. If the learned should speak truth of it, here it is, and all that belongs to it. Ask me if I am a courtier. It shall do you no harm to learn. To be young again, if we could. I will be a fool in question, hoping to be the wiser by your answer. I pray you, sir, are you a courtier? <clears throat> oh, Lord, sir! There's a simple pudding off. More, more, a hundred of them! Sir, I am a poor friend of yours that loves you. Oh, Lord, sir! Thick, thick, spare not me! I think, sir, you can eat none of this homely meat. Oh, oh, Lord, sir! Nay, put me to it, I warrant you. You were lately whipped, sir, as I think. Oh, Lord, sir, spare not me. Do you cry, O oh Lord, sir, at your whipping, and spare not me? Indeed, your own lord, sir, is very sequent to your whipping. You would answer very well to a whipping if you were but bound to it. I ne'er had worse luck in my life in my... Oh, lord, sir, I see things may serve long, but not serve ever. I play the noble housewife with the time to entertain so merrily with a fool. Oh, lord, sir... Why, there it serves well again. An end, sir, to your business. Give Helen this, and urge her to a present answer back. Commend me to my kinsman and my son. This is not much. Not much commendation to them. <laughs> not much employment for you, you understand me? Most fruitfully. I am there before my legs. Haste you again. Exeunt severally. Scene 3. Paris, the King's Palace. Enter Bertram, Lafeu, and Parolles. They say miracles are past, and we have our philosophical persons to make modern and familiar things supernatural and causeless. Hence it is that we make trifles of terrors, ensconcing ourselves into seeming knowledge, 
when we should submit ourselves to an unknown fear why tis the rarest argument of wonder that has shot out in our latter times and so tis to be relinquished of the artists so i say both of galen and paracelsus so i say of all the learned and authentic fellows <laughs> right so i say that gave him out incurable <laughs> why there it is so say i too not to be helped <laughs> right as twere a man assured of a uncertain life and sure death just you say well <laughs> so would i have said i may truly say it is a novelty to the world it is indeed if you will have it in showing you shall read it in what, what do you call it there a showing of a heavenly effect in an earthly actor oh, that's it i would have said the very same why your dolphin is not lustier for me i speak in respect nay tis strange tis very strange that is the brief and the tedious of it and he's of a most fascinerious spirit that would not acknowledge it to be the very hand of heaven ay so i say in a most weak and debile minister great power great transcendence which should indeed give us a further use to be made than alone the recovery of the king has to be generally thankful <laughs> i would have said it <laughs> you say well oh, here comes the king enter king helena and attendants lafew and parolles retire lustig as the dutchman says how like a maid the better whilst i have a tooth in my head <laughs> why he's able to lead her a caranto mon du vinaigre is not this helen for god i think so go call before me all the lords in court sit my preserver by thy patient side and with this healthful hand whose banished sense thou hast repealed a second time receive the confirmation of my promised gift which but attends thy naming enter three or four lords fair maid send forth thine eye this youthful parcel of noble bachelors stand at my bestowing or whom both sovereign power and father's voice i have to use thy frank election make thou hast power to choose and they none to forsake to each of you one fair and virtuous mistress fall when love please marry to each but one i'd give bay kirtle and his furniture my mouth no more were broken than these boys and writ as little beard peruse them well not one of those but had a noble father gentlemen heaven hath through me restored the king to health we understand it and thank heaven for you i am a simple maid and therein wealthiest that i protest i simply am a maid please it your majesty i have done already the blushes in my cheeks thus whisper me we blush that thou shouldst choose but be refused let the white death sit on thy cheek for ever we'll ne'er come there again make choice and see who shuns thy love shuns all his love in me now dian from thy altar do i fly and to imperial love that god most high do my sighs stream sir will you hear my suit and grant it thanks sir all the rest is mute <laughs> i had rather be in this choice than throw aim's ace for my life the honour sir that flames in your fair eyes before i speak too threateningly replies love make your fortunes twenty times above her that so wishes and her humble love no better if you please my wish receive which great love grant and so i take my leave 
do they all deny her and they were sons of mine i'd have them whipped or i would send them to the turk to make eunuchs of be not afraid that i your hand should take i'll never do you wrong for your own sake blessing upon your vows and in your bed find fairer fortune if you ever wed these boys are boys of ice they'll none have her sure they are bastards to the english the french ne'er got em you are too young too happy and too good to make yourself a son out of my blood fair one i think not so there's one grape yet i am sure thy father drunk wine but if thou beest not an ass i am a youth of fourteen i have known thee already helena to bertram i dare not say i take you but i give me and my service ever whilst i live into your guiding power this is the man why then young bertram take her she is thy wife my wife my liege i shall beseech your highness in such a business give me leave to use the health of my own eyes know'st thou not bertram what she has done for me yes my good lord but never hope to know why i should marry her thou know'st she has raised me from my sickly bed but follows it my lord to bring me down must answer for your raising i know her well she had her breeding at my father's charge her poor physician's daughter my wife disdain rather corrupt me ever tis only title thou disdain'st in her the which i can build up strange is it that our bloods of colour weight and heat poured all together would quite confound distinction yet stand off in differences so mighty if she be all that is virtuous save what thou dislikest a poor physician's daughter thou dislikest of virtue for the name but do not so from lowest place when virtuous things proceed the place is dignified by the doer's deed where great addition swells and virtue none it is a dropsied honour good alone is good without a name vileness is so the property by what it is should go not by the title she is young wise fair in these to nature she's immediate heir and these breed honour that is honour's scorn which challenges itself as honour's born and is not like the sire honours thrive when rather from our acts we them derive than our foregoers the mere words a slave deboshed on every tomb on every grave a lying trophy and as oft is dumb where dust and damned oblivion is the tomb of honoured bones indeed what should be said if thou canst like this creature as a maid i can create the rest virtue and she is her own dower honour and wealth from me i cannot love her nor will strive to do it thou wrong'st thyself if thou should strive to choose that you are well restored my lord i'm glad let the rest go my honour's at the stake which to defeat i must produce my power here take her hand proud scornful boy unworthy this good gift that doth in vile misprision shackle up my love and her desert that canst not dream we poising us in her defective scale shall weigh thee to the beam that wilt not know it is in us to plant thine honour where we please to have it grow check thy contempt obey our will which travails in thy good believe not thy disdain but presently do thine own fortunes that obedient right which both thy duty owes and our power claims or i will throw thee from my care for ever into the staggers and the careless lapse of youth and ignorance both my revenge and hate loosing upon thee in the name of justice without all terms of pity speak thine answer pardon my gracious lord for i submit my fancy to your eyes when i consider what great creation and what dole of honour flies where you bid it i find that she which late was in my nobler thoughts most base is now 
the praise it of the king, who, so ennobled, is as twere born so. Take her by the hand, and tell her she is thine, to whom I promise a counterpoise, if not to thy estate, a balance more replete. I take her hand. Good fortune and the favour of the king smile upon this contract, whose ceremony shall seem expedient on the now-born brief, and be performed to-night. The solemn feast shall more attend upon the coming space, expecting absent friends. As thou lovest her, thy loves to me religious, else does her. Exeunt all but La Few and Paroles. Advancing. Do you hear, monsieur? A word with you. Your pleasure, sir? Your lord and master did well to make his recantation. Ha! <laughs> recantation? My lord? My master? Ay, is it not a language I speak? A most harsh one, and not to be understood without bloody succeeding, my master. Are you companion to the Count Rossillian? To any count, to all counts, to what is man? To what is Count's man? Count's master is of another style. You are too old, sir. Let it satisfy you, you are too old. I must tell thee, sirrah, I write man, to which title age cannot bring thee. What I dare too well do, I dare not do. I did think thee for two ordinaries to be a pretty wise fellow. Thou didst make tolerable vent of thy travel. It might pass, yet the scarfs and the bannerets about thee did manifoldly dissuade me from believing thee a vessel of too great a burthen. I have now found thee. When I lose thee again I care not. Yet art thou good for nothing but taking up, and that thou'rt scarce worth. Hadst thou not the privilege of antiquity upon thee? <laughs> Do not plunge thyself too far in anger, lest thou hasten thy trial, which if, Lord have mercy on thee for a hen, so, my good window of lattice, fare thee well. Thy casement I need not open, for I look through thee. <sighs> give me thy hand. My lord, you give me the most egregious indignity. Ay, with all my heart, and thou art worthy of it. I have not, my lord, deserved it. Yes, good faith, every dram of it, and I will not bait thee a scruple. Well, I shall be wiser. Even as soon as thou canst, for thou hast to pull at a smack of the contrary. If ever thou beest bound in thy scarf and beaten, thou shalt find what it is to be proud of thy bondage. <sighs> I have a desire to hold my acquaintance with thee, or rather my knowledge, that I may say in the default, he is a man I know. My lord, you do me most insupportable vexation. I would it were hell pains for thy sake, and my poor doing eternal. For doing I am past, as I will by thee, in what motion age will give me leave. Exit. Well, thou hast a son shall take this disgrace off me. Scurvy, old, filthy, scurvy lord. Well, I must be patient. There is no fettering of authority. I'll beat him. By my life, if I can meet him with any convenience, any word, double and double, Lord, I'll have no more pity of his age than if I would have... <laughs> I'll beat him, and if I could but meet him again... Re-enter Lafeu. Sirrah, your lord and master's married. There's news for you. You have a new mistress. 
I most unfeignedly beseech your lordship to make some reservation of your wrongs. He is my good lord, whom I serve above is my master. Who? God? Ay, sir. The devil it is that's thy master. Why dost thou garter up thy arms of this fashion? Dost make hose of sleeves? Do other servants so? Thou wert best set thy lower part where thy nose stands. By mine honour, if I were but two hours younger, I'd beat thee. Methinks thou art a general offence, and every man should beat thee. I think thou wast created for men to breathe themselves upon thee. That is hard and undeserved measure, my lord. Go to, sir. You were beaten in Italy for picking a kernel out of a pomegranate. You are a vagabond and no true traveller. You are more saucy with lords and honourable personages than the commission of your birth and virtue gives you heraldry. You are not worth another word, else I'd call you knave. I leave you. Exit. Good, very good. It is so, then. Good, very good. Let it be concealed a while. Re-enter Bertram. Undone and forfeited to cares for ever. What's the matter, sweetheart? Although before the solemn priest I have sworn, I will not bed her. What? What, sweetheart? Oh, my paroles, they have married me! I'll to the Tuscan wars, and never bed her. Fred's is a dog-hole, and it no more merits the tread of a man's foot. To the wars! There's letters from my mother. What the import is, I know not yet. Aye, that would be known. To the wars, my boy, to the wars! He wears his honour in a box unseen, that hugs his kicky-wicky here at home, spending his manly marrow in her arms, which should sustain the bound and high curvet of Mars's fiery steed. To other regions, France is a stable, we that dwell in jades. Therefore, to the war! It shall be so. I'll send her to my house, acquaint my mother with my hate to her and wherefore I am fled, write to the king that which I durst not speak. His present gift shall furnish me to those Italian fields where noble fellows strike. War is no strife to the dark house and the detested wife. Will this capriccio your hold in thee? Art sure? Go with me to my chamber and advise me. I'll send her straight away. Tomorrow. I'll to the wars, she to her single sorrow. Why, these balls bound, there's noise in it. Tis hard. A young man married is a man that's marred. Therefore, away and leave her bravely. Go. The king has done you wrong. But hush, tis so. Exempt. Scene 4. Paris, the king's palace. Enter Helena and Clown. My mother greets me kindly. Is she well? She is not well, but yet she has her health. She's very merry, but yet she is not well. But thanks be given, she's very well, and wants nothing in the world, but yet she is not well. If she be very well, what does she ail that she's not very well? Truly, she's very well indeed but for two things what two things one that she's not in heaven whither god send her quickly the other that she's in earth from whence god send her quickly enter parolles bless you my fortunate lady i hope sir i have your good will to have mine own good fortunes you had my prayers to lead them on and to keep them on, have them still. Oh, my knave, how does my old lady? So that you had her wrinkles, and I her money. I would she did as you say. Why, I say nothing. Mary, you are the wiser man, for many a man's tongue shakes out his master's undoing. To say nothing, 
to do nothing, to know nothing, and to have nothing, is to be a great part of your title, which is within a very little of nothing. Away! Thou art a knave! You should have said, sir, before a knave, thou'rt a knave. That's before me, thou'rt a knave. This had been truth, sir. Go to! Oh, thou art a witty fool. I have found thee. Did you find me in yourself, sir? Or were you taught to find me? The search, sir, was profitable, and much fool may you find in you, even to the world's pleasure and the increase of laughter. A good knave, if faith, and well fed. Madam, my lord will go away to-night. A very serious business calls on him. The great prerogative and right of love, which, as your due time claims, he does acknowledge, but puts it off to a compelled restraint, whose want and whose delay is strewed with sweets, which they distill now in the curbed time to make the coming hour o'erflow with joy and pleasure down the brim. What's his will else? That you will take your instant leave of the king, and make this haste as your own good proceeding, strengthened with what apology you think may make it probable need. What more commands he? That, having this obtained, you presently attend his further pleasure. In everything I wait upon his will. I shall report it so. I pray you. Exit Parolles. Come, Sirrah. Exeunt. Scene five. Paris, the King's Palace. Enter Lafeu and Bertram. But I hope your lordship thinks not him a soldier. Yes, my lord, and a very valiant approve. You have it from his own deliverance. And by other warranted testimony. Then my dial goes not true. I took this lark for a bunting. I do assure you, my lord, he is very great in knowledge, and, accordingly, valiant. I have then sinned against his experience, and transgressed against his valour. And my state that way is dangerous, since I cannot yet find in my heart to repent. Here he comes. I pray you, make us friends. I will pursue the amity. Enter Parolles to Bertram. These things shall be done, sir. Pray you, sir, who's his tailor? Sir? Oh, I know him well, I, sir. He, sir, a good workman, a very good tailor. Aside to Parolles. Is she gone to the king? She is. Will she away to-night? As you'll have her. I have writ my letters, casketed my treasure, given order for our horses, and to-night, when I should take possession of the bride, end ere I do begin. A good traveller is something at the latter end of a dinner, but one that lies three-thirds, and uses a known truth to pass a thousand nothings with, should be once heard and thrice beaten. God save you, Captain. Is there any unkindness between my lord and you, monsieur? I know not how I have deserved to run into my lord's displeasure. <laughs> you have made shift to run into it, boots and spurs and all, like him that leapt into the custard, and out of it you'll run again, rather than suffer question for your residence. It may be you have mistaken him, my lord. <laughs> and shall do so ever, though I took him at his prayers. Fare you well, my lord, and believe this of me, there can be no kernel in this light nut. The soul of this man is his clothes. Trust him not in matter of heavy consequence. I have kept of them tame, and know their natures. Farewell, monsieur. I have spoken better of you than you have or will to deserve at my hand. But we must do good against evil. Exit. An 
idle lord <laughs> i swear i think not so why do you not know him yes i do know him well and common speech gives him a worthy pass oh, here comes my clog enter helena i have sir as i was commanded from you spoke with the king and have procured his leave for present parting only he desires some private speech with you i shall obey his will you must not marvel helen at my course which holds not colour with the time nor does the ministration and required office on my particular prepared i was not for such a business therefore am i found so much unsettled this drives me to entreat you that presently you take your way for home and rather muse than ask why i entreat you for my respects are better than they seem and my appointments have in them a need greater than shows itself at the first view to you that know them not this to my mother giving a letter it will be two days ere i shall see you so i leave you to your wisdom sir i can nothing say but that i am your most obedient servant come come no more of that and ever shall with true observance seek to eke out that wherein toward me my homely stars have failed to equal my great fortune let that go my haste is very great farewell high home pray sir your pardon well what would you say i am not worthy of the wealth i owe nor dare i say tis mine and yet it is but like a timorous thief most fain would steal what law does vouch mine own what would you have something and scarce so much nothing indeed i would not tell you what i would my lord faith yes strangers and foes do sunder and not kiss i pray you stay not but haste to horse i shall not break your bidding good my lord where are my other men monsieur farewell exit helena go thou toward home where i will never come whilst i can shake my sword or hear the drum away and for our flight bravely coraggio exeunt end of act two Act Three of All's Well That Ends Well. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three of All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare. Scene One, Florence, the Duke's Palace. Flourish. Enter the Duke of Florence attended the two frenchmen with a troop of soldiers so that from point to point now have you heard the fundamental reasons of this war whose great decision hath much blood let forth and more thirsts after holy seems the quarrel upon your grace's part black and fearful on the opposer therefore we marvel much our cousin france would in so just a business shut his bosom against our borrowing prayers good my lord the reasons of our state i cannot yield but like a common and an outward man that the great figure of a council frames by self unable motion therefore dare not say what i think of it since i have found myself in my uncertain grounds to fail as often as i guessed be it his pleasure but i am sure the younger of our nature that surfeit on their ease will day by day come here for physic welcome shall they be and all the honours that fly from us shall on them settle you know your places well when better fall for your avails they fell to-morrow to the field flourish exeunt scene two rossillon the count's palace enter countess and clown it has happened all as i would have had it save that he comes not along with her by my troth I take my young lord to be a very melancholy man. By what observance, I pray you? Why, he will look upon his boot and sing. Mend the roof and sing. Ask questions and sing. Pick his teeth and sing. I know a man that had this trick of melancholy sold a goodly manner for a song. Let me see what he writes and when he means to come. Opening a letter. 
I have no mind to Isbel since I was at court. Our old ling and our Isbels of the country are nothing like your old ling and your Isbels of the court. The brains of my cupids knocked out, and I begin to love as an old man loves money with no stomach. What have we here? In that you have there. Exit. Countess reads. I have sent you a daughter-in-law. She hath recovered the king and undone me. I have wedded her, not bedded her, and sworn to make the not eternal. You shall hear I am run away. Know it before the report come. If there be breadth enough in the world, I will hold a long distance. My duty to you, your unfortunate son, Bertram. This is not well rationed, unbridled boy, to fly the favours of so good a king, to pluck his indignation on thy head by the misprising of a maid too virtuous for the contempt of empire. Re-enter Clown. Oh, madam, yonder is heavy news within, between two soldiers and my young lady. What is the matter? Nay, there is some comfort in the news, some comfort. Your son will not be killed so soon as I thought he would. Why should he be killed? So say I, madam, if he run away, as I hear he does. The danger is in standing to it. That's the loss of men, though it be the getting of children. Here they come, will tell you more. For my part, I only hear your son was run away. Exit. Enter Helena and two gentlemen. Save you, good madam. Madam, my lord is gone, for ever gone. Do not say so. Think upon patience. Pray you, gentlemen. I have felt so many quirks of joy and grief that the first face of neither on the start can woman me unto it. Where is my son, I pray you? Madam, he's gone to serve the Duke of Florence. We met him thitherward, for thence we came, and, after some dispatch in hand at court, thither we bend again. Look on his letter, madam, here's my passport. Reads. When thou canst get the ring upon my finger which never shall come off, and show me a child begotten of thy body that I am father to, then call me husband. But in such a then I write a never. This is a dreadful sentence. Brought you this letter, gentlemen? Ay, madam, and for the content's sake are sorry for our pain. I prithee, lady, have a better cheer. If thou engrossest all the griefs are thine, thou robst me of a moiety. He was my son, but I do wash his name out of my blood, and thou art all my child. Towards Florence, is he? Ay, madam. And to be a soldier? Such is his noble purpose, and believed the Duke will lay upon him all the honour that good convenience claims. Return you thither? Ay, madam, with the swiftest wing of speed. Reads. Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Tis bitter. Find you that there. Ay, madam. Tis but the boldness of his hand, haply, which his heart was not consenting to. Nothing in France until he have no wife. There's nothing here that is too good for him but only she. And she deserves a lord that twenty such rude boys might tend upon and call her hourly mistress. Who was with him? A servant only, and a gentleman, which I have some time known. Parolles, was it not? Ay, my good lady, he. A very tainted fellow and full of wickedness. My son corrupts a well-derived nature with his inducement. Indeed, good lady, the fellow has a deal of that too much which holds him much to have. You're welcome, gentlemen. I will entreat you when you see my son to tell him that his sword can never win the honour that he loses. More I'll entreat you written to bear along. We serve you, madam, in that and all your worthiest affairs. 
Not so, but as we change our courtesies. Will you draw near? Exeunt Countess and Gentlemen Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Nothing in France until he have no wife. Thou shalt have none, Rosilian, none in France. Then hast thou all again. Poor Lord! Is't I that chase thee from thy country, And expose those tender limbs of thine To the event of the nun-sparing war? And is it I that drive thee from the sport of court, Where thou wast shot at with fair eyes To be the mark of smoky muskets? O oh, you leaden messengers that ride Upon the violent speed of fire, Fly with false aim! Move the still-peering air that sings with piercing, Do not touch my lord! Whoever shoots at him, I set him there. Whoever charges on his forward breast, I am the caitiff that do hold him to it. And though I kill him not, I am the cause his death was so affected. Better twere I met the raven lion when he roared with sharp constraint of hunger. Better twere that all the miseries which nature owes were mine at once. No, come thou home, Rosilian, whence honour but of danger wins a scar, as oft it loses all. I will be gone. My being here it is that holds thee hence. Shall I stay here to do it? No, no, although the air of paradise did fan the house and angels offest all, I will be gone. That pitiful rumour may report my flight to consolate thine ear. Come, night, end day. For with the dark, poor thief, I'll steal away. Exit. Scene three. Florence, before the Duke's palace. Flourish. Enter the Duke of Florence, Bertram, Parolles, soldiers, drum, and trumpets. The general of our horse thou art, and we, great in our hope, lay our best love and credence upon thy promising fortune. Sir! It is a charge too heavy for my strength, but yet we'll strive to bear it for your worthy sake to the extreme edge of hazard. Then go thou forth, and fortune play upon thy prosperous helm as thy auspicious mistress. This very day, great Mars, I put myself into thy file. Make me but like my thoughts, and I shall prove a lover of thy drum, hater of love. Exeunt. Scene four. Rossillon, the Count's palace. Enter Countess and Steward. Alas! And would you take the letter of her? Might you not know she would do as she has done by sending me a letter? Read it again. Reads. I am Saint Jock's pilgrim, thither gone. Ambitious love hath so in me offended that barefoot plod I the cold ground upon, with sainted vow my faults to have amended. Write, write, that from the bloody course of war my dearest master, your dear son, may high. Bless him at home in peace, whilst I from far his name with zealous fervour sanctify. His taken labours bid him me forgive. I, his despiteful Juno, sent him forth from courtly friends with camping foes to live where death and danger dogs the heels of worth. He is too good and fair for death and me, whom I myself embrace to set him free. What sharp stings are in her mildest words! Rinaldo, you did never lack advice so much as letting her pass so. Had I spoke with her, I could have well diverted her intents, which thus she hath prevented. Pardon me, madam, if I had given you this at overnight, she might have been o'ertaken, and yet she writes, pursuit would be but vain. What angel shall bless this unworthy husband? He cannot thrive unless her prayers, whom heaven delights to hear and loves to grant, reprieve him from the wrath of greatest justice. Write, write, Rinaldo, to this unworthy husband of his wife. Let every word weigh heavy of her worth that he does weigh too light. My greatest grief, though little he do feel it, set down sharply. Dispatch the most convenient messenger, 
when haply he shall hear that she is gone he will return and hope i may that she hearing so much will speed her foot again led hither by pure love which of them both is dearest to me i have no skill in sense to make distinction provide this messenger my heart is heavy and mine age is weak grief would have tears and sorrow bids me speak Exeunt. scene five florence without the walls a tucket afar off enter an old widow of florence diana violenta and mariana with other citizens nay come for if they do approach the city we shall lose all the sight they say the french count has done most honourable service it is reported that he has taken their greatest commander and that with his own hand he slew the duke's brother tuck it we have lost our labour they are gone a contrary way hark you may know by their trumpets come let's return again and suffice ourselves with the report of it well diana take heed of this french earl the honour of a maid is her name and no legacy is so rich as honesty i have told my neighbour how you have been solicited by a gentleman his companion i know that knave hang him one pearl does a filthy officer he is in those suggestions for the young earl beware of them diana their promises enticements oaths tokens and all these engines of lust are not the thing they go under many a maid hath been seduced by them and the misery is example that so terrible shows in the wreck of maidenhood cannot for all that dissuade succession but that they are lined with the twigs that threaten them i hope i need not to advise you further but i hope your own grace will keep you where you are though there were no further danger known but the modesty which is lost you shall not need to fear me i hope so enter helena disguised like a pilgrim look here comes a pilgrim i know she will lie at my house thither they send one another i'll question her god save you pilgrim whither are you bound to st jacques le grand where do the palmers lodge i do beseech you at the st francis here beside the port is this the way i marry ist a march afar hark you they come this way if you will tarry holy pilgrim but till the troops come by i will conduct you where you shall be lodged the rather for i think i know your hostess as ample as myself is it yourself if you shall please so pilgrim i thank you and will stay upon your leisure you came i think from france i did so here you shall see a countryman of yours that has done worthy service his name i pray you the count rousillon know you such a one but by the ear that hears most nobly of him his face i know not Whatsoe'er he is, he's bravely taken here. He stole from France, as tis reported, for the king had married him against his liking. Think you it is so? Ay, surely, mere the truth, I know his lady. There is a gentleman that serves the count, reports but coarsely of her. What's his name? Monsieur Parolles. Oh, I believe with him an argument of praise, or to the worth of the great count himself, she is too mean to have her name repeated. All her deserving is a reserved honesty, and that I have not heard examined. Alas, poor lady! Tis a hard bondage to become the wife of a detesting lord. I warrant, good creature, wheresoe'er she is, her heart weighs sadly. This young maid might do her a shrewd turn, if she pleased. How do you mean? Maybe the amorous count solicits her in the unlawful purpose? He does indeed, and brokes with all that can in such a suit corrupt the tender honour of a maid. But she is armed for him, and keeps her guard in honestest defence. The gods forbid else. So, now they come. Drum and colours. Enter Bertram, Parolles, and the whole army. That is Antonio, the duke's eldest son. That, Aeschylus. Which is the Frenchman? He. That with the plume. Tis a most gallant fellow. I would he loved his wife. If he were honester, he were much goodlier. Is not a handsome gentleman. I like him well. 
"'Tis pity he is not honest. "'Yon's that same knave that leads him to these places. "'Were I his lady, I would poison that vile rascal. "'Which is he?' "'That jackanapes with scarfs. "'Why is he melancholy?' "'Perchance he's hurt to the battle.' "'Lose our drum? "'Well!' "'He's shrewdly vexed at something. "'Look, he has spied us.' "'Mary, hang you!' "'And your courtesy for a ring-carrier.' Exeunt Bertram, Parolles, and Army. The troop is past. Come, pilgrim, I will bring you where you shall host. Of enjoined penitence there's four or five to great St. Jack was bound already at my house. I humbly thank you. Please it this matron and this gentle maid to eat with us to-night. The charge and thanking shall be for me, and to requite you further I will bestow some precepts of this virgin worthy the note. We'll take, take your, your offer, offer kindly. kindly. Exeunt. Scene six. Camp before Florence. Enter Bertram and the two French lords. Nay, good my lord, put him to it. Let him have his way. If your lordship find him not a hilding, hold me no more in your respect. On my life, my lord, a bubble. Do you think I am so far deceived in him? Believe it, my lord, in mine own direct knowledge, without any malice but to speak of him as my kinsman. He's a most notable coward, an infinite and endless liar, an hourly promise-breaker, the owner of no one good quality worthy your lordship's entertainment. It were fit you knew him, lest, reposing too far in his virtue, which he hath not, he might at some great and trusty business in a main danger fail you. I would I knew in what particular action to try him. None better than to let him fetch off his drum, which you hear him so confidently undertake to do. I, with a troop of Florentines, will suddenly surprise him. Such I will have, whom I am sure he knows not from the enemy. We will bind and hoodwink him so that he shall suppose no other, but that he is carried into the leaguer of the adversaries when we bring him to our own tents. Be but your lordship present at his examination. If he do not, for the promise of his life and in the highest compulsion of base fear, offer to betray you and deliver all the intelligence in his power against you, and that with the divine forfeit of his soul upon oath, never trust my judgment in anything. Oh, for the love of laughter, let him fetch his drum. He says he has a stratagem for it. When your lordship sees the bottom of his success in it, and to what metal this counterfeit lump of ore will be melted, if you give him not John Drum's entertainment, your inclining cannot be removed. Here he comes. Enter Parolles. Aside to Bertram. Oh, for the love of laughter, hinder not the honour of his design. Let him fetch off his drum in any hand. How now, monsieur? This drum sticks sorely in your disposition. A pox on it! Let it go! Tis but a drum! But a drum! Is't but a drum? A drum so lost? Ha! There was an excellent command, to charge in with our horse upon our own wings, and to rend our own soldiers. That was not to be blamed in the command of the service. It was a disaster of war that Caesar himself could not have prevented if he had been there to command. Well, we cannot greatly condemn our success. Some dishonour we had in the loss of that drum, but it is not to be recovered. It might have been recovered. It might, but it's not now. It is to be recovered. But that the merit of service is seldom attributed to the true and exact performer, I would have that drum, or another, or hick jacket. Why, if you have a stomach to it, monsieur? If you think your mystery in stratagem can bring this instrument of honour again into his native quarter, be magnanimous in the enterprise and go on. I will grace the attempt for a worthy exploit. If you speed well in it, the Duke shall both speak of it and extend to you what further becomes his greatness, even to the utmost syllable of your worthiness. By the hand of a soldier, I will undertake it. But you must not now slumber in it. I'll about it this evening, and I will presently pen down my dilemmas, encourage myself in my certainty, put myself into my moral preparation, and by midnight look to hear further from me. May I be bold to acquaint his grace you are gone about it? I know not what the success will be, my lord, but the attempt 
I vow. I know thou art valiant, and to the possibility of thy soldiership will subscribe for thee. Farewell. I love not many words. Exit. No more than a fish loves water. Is not this a strange fellow, my lord, that so confidently seems to undertake this business, which he knows is not to be done, damns himself to do, and dares better to be damned than to do it? You do not know him, my lord, as we do. Certain it is that he will steal himself into a man's favor, and for a week escape a great deal of discoveries. But when you find him out, you have him ever after. Why? Do you think he will make no deed at all of this that so seriously he does address himself unto? None in the world, but return with an invention and clap upon you two or three probable lies. But we have almost embossed him. You shall see his fall to-night, for indeed he is not for your lordship's respect. We'll make you some sport with a fox ere we case him. He was first smoked by the old lord Lafo. When his disguise and he is parted, tell me what a sprat you shall find him, which you shall see this very night. I must go look my twigs. He shall be caught. Your brother he shall go along with me. As to please your lordship, I'll leave you. Exit. Now will I lead you to the house, and show you the lass I spoke of. But you say she's honest. That's all the fault. I spoke with her but once and found her wondrous cold, but I sent to her, by this same cockscomb that we have in the wind, tokens and letters, which she did resend. And this is all I've done. She's a fair creature. Will you go see her? With all my heart, my lord. Exeunt. Scene 7. Florence, the widow's house. Enter Helena and widow. If you misdoubt me that I am not she, I know not how I shall assure you further, but I shall lose the grounds I work upon. Though my estate be fallen, I was well born. Nothing acquainted with these businesses. Would not put reputation now in any staining act. Nor would I wish you. First, give me trust. The Count, he is my husband, and what to your sworn counsel I have spoken is so from word to word. And then you cannot, by the good aid that I of you shall borrow, err in bestowing it. I should believe you, for you have showed me that which well approves, your great in fortune. Take this purse of gold, and let me buy your friendly help thus far, which I will overpay and pay again when I have found it. The Count, he woos your daughter, lays down his wanton siege before her beauty, resolved to carry her. Let her in fine consent, as will direct her how tis best to bear it. Now his important blood will not deny that she'll demand. A ring the county wears, that downward hath succeeded in his house from son to son, some four or five descents from the first father wore it. This ring he holds in most rich choice, yet in his idle fire to buy his will it would not seem too dear, how e'er repented after. Now I see the bottom of your purpose. You see it lawful, then. It is no more but that your daughter, ere she seems as one, desires this ring, appoints him an encounter, in fine, delivers me to fill the time, herself most chastely absent. After this, to marry her, I'll add three thousand crowns to what is past already. I have yielded. Instruct my daughter, how she shall persevere, the time and place with this deceit so lawful may prove coherent. Every night he comes with musics of all sorts and songs composed to her unworthiness. It nothing steads us to chide him from our eaves, for he persists as if his life lay on't. Why then to-night let us assay our plot, which of its speed is wicked meaning in a lawful deed, and lawful meaning in a lawful act, where both not sin and yet a sinful fact. But let's about it. Exeunt. End of Act Three. Act Four of All's Well That Ends Well. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 4 of All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare.
Scene 1. Without the Florentine camp. Enter second French lord with five or six other soldiers in ambush. He can come no other way but by this hedge corner. When you sally upon him, speak what terrible language you will, though you understand it not yourselves, no matter, for we must not seem to understand him, unless some one among us whom we must produce for an interpreter. Good captain, let me be the interpreter. Art not acquainted with him? Knows he not thy voice? No, sir, I warrant you. But what linsey woolsey hast thou to speak to us again? Even such as you speak to me. He must think us some band of strangers of the adversary's entertainment. Now he hath a smack of all neighboring languages. Therefore we must every one be a man of his own fancy, not to know what we speak one to another. So we seem to know is to know straight our purpose. Chuff's language, gabble enough and good enough. As for you, interpreter, you must seem very politic. But couch, ho! Here he comes, to beguile two hours in a sleep, and then to return and swear the lies he forges. Enter Parolles. Ten o'clock. Within these three hours it will be time enough to go home. What shall I say I have done? It must be a very plausive invention that carries it. They begin to smoke me, and disgraces have of late knocked too often at my door. I find my tongue is too foolhardy, but my heart hath the fear of Mars before it, and of his creatures, not daring the reports of my tongue. This is the first truth that e'er thine tongue was guilty of. What the devil should move me to undertake the recovery of this drum, being not ignorant of the impossibility, and knowing I had no such purpose? I must give myself some hurts, and say I got them in exploit. Yet... Slight ones will not carry it. They will say, came you off with so little, and great ones I dare not give. Wherefore, what's the instance? <laughs> Tongue, I must put you into a butterwoman's mouth and buy myself another of Bajazet's mule if you prattle me into these perils. Is it possible he should know what he is and be that he is? I would the cutting of my garments would serve the turn, or the breaking of my Spanish sword. We cannot afford you so. Or the bearing of my beard, and to say it was in stratagem. T'would not do. Or to drown my clothes, and say I was stripped. Hardly serve. Though I swore I leaped from the window of the citadel. How deep? Thirty fathom. Three great oaths would scarce make that be believed. I would I had any drum of the enemies. I would swear I recovered it. You shall hear one anon. Oh, a drum now of the enemies. Alarum within. Throca Movousus. Cargo, cargo, cargo. Cargo, cargo, cargo. cargo. Oh, ransom. Ransom, do not hide my eyes. They seize and blindfold him. Boscos trammel to Boscos. Ha, I, I know you are the Muscos Regiment, and I shall lose my life for want of language. Uh, if there be here German or Dane, uh, Low Dutch, Italian or French, let him speak to me. I'll discover that which shall undo the Florentine. Boscos Volvedo, I understand thee, and can speak thy tongue. Kerli Bonto, sir, betake thee to thy fate. For seventeen poniards are at thy bosom. Oh! Oh, pray, pray, pray. Manca rivania dulce. Oscor be dulcios vale vorco. The general is content to spare thee yet. And who doing as thou art will lead thee on. Together from thee, haply thou mayst inform something to save thy life. Oh, let me live! And all the secrets of our camp I'll show. The, their force, their purposes... And nay, I'll speak that which you will wonder at. But wilt thou faithfully? If I do not, damn me. Accord Linta. Come on, thou art granted space. Exit with Parolles guarded. A short alarum within. Go, tell the Count Rusillon and my brother. We have caught the woodcock, and will keep him muffled till we do hear from them. Captain, I will. I will betray us all unto ourselves. Inform on that. So I will, sir. Till then, I'll keep him dark and safely locked. Exeunt.
Scene 2. Florence, the widow's house. Enter Bertram and Diana. They told me that your name was Fontybell. No, my good lord, Diana. Titled goddess. And worth it. With addition. But, fair soul, in your fine frame, have love no quality? If the quick fire of youth light not your mind, you are no maiden, but a monument. When you are dead, you should be such a one as you are now, for you are cold and stern, and now you should be as your mother was when your sweet self was got. She then was honest. So should you be. No, my mother did but duty, such, my lord, as you owe to your wife. No more of that. I prithee do not strive against my vows. I was compelled to her, but I love thee by love's own sweet constraint, and will for ever do thee all rights of service. Ay, so you serve us till we serve you, but when you have our roses you barely leave our thorns to prick ourselves and mock us with our bareness. How have I sworn? Tis not the many oaths that makes the truth, but the plain single vow that is vowed true. What is not holy, that we swear not by, but take the highest to witness. Then pray you tell me, if I should swear by God's great attributes I loved you dearly, would you believe my oaths when I did love you ill? This has no holding to swear by him whom I protest to love, that I will work against him. Therefore your oaths are words and poor conditions, but unsealed, at least in my opinion. Change it, change it. Be not so wholly cruel. Love is holy, and my integrity ne'er knew the crafts that you do charge men with. Stand no more off, but give thyself unto my sick desires. Who then recovers? Say thou art mine, and ever my love as it begins shall so persever. I see that men make ropes in such a scar that we'll forsake ourselves. Give me that ring. I I'll lend it thee, my dear, but have no power to give it from me. Will you not, my lord? It is an honour longing to our house, bequeathed down from many ancestors, which were the greatest obloquy in the world in me to lose. Mine honours such a ring. My chastity's the jewel of our house, bequeathed down from many ancestors, which were the greatest obloquy of the world in me to lose. Thus your own proper wisdom brings in the champion honour on my part against your vain assault. Here. Take my ring. My house, mine honour, yea, my life be thine, and I'll be bid by thee. When midnight comes, knock at my chamber window. I'll order take my mother shall not hear. Now will I charge you in the band of truth. When you have conquered my yet maiden bed, remain there but an hour, nor speak to me. My reasons are most strong, and you shall know them when back again this ring shall be delivered. And on your finger in the night I'll put another ring, that what in time proceeds may token to the future our past deeds. Adieu till then. Then fail not. You have won a wife of me, though there my hope be done. A heaven on earth I have won by wooing thee. Exit. For which live long to thank both heaven and me. You may so in the end. My mother told me just how he would woo, as if she sat in's heart. She says all men have the like oaths. He had sworn to marry me when his wife's dead, therefore I'll lie with him when I am buried. Since Frenchmen are so braid, marry that will, I live and die a maid. Only in this disguise I think no sin to cousin him that would unjustly win. Exit. Scene 3. The Florentine Camp. Enter the two French lords and some two or three soldiers. You have not given him his mother's letter? I have delivered it an hour since. There is something in it that stings his nature, for on the reading it he changed almost into another man. He has much worthy blame laid upon him for shaking off so good a wife and so sweet a lady. Especially he hath incurred the everlasting displeasure of the king, who had even tuned his bounty to sing happiness to him. I will tell you a thing, but you shall let it dwell darkly with you. When you have spoken it, tis dead, and I am the grave of it. 
He hath perverted a young gentlewoman here in Florence, of a most chaste renown, and this night he fleshes his will in the spoil of her honour. He hath given her his monumental ring, and thinks himself made in the unchaste composition. Now God delay our rebellion, as we are ourselves. What things are we? Merely our own traitors. And as in the common course of all treasons, we still see them reveal themselves till they attain to their abhorred ends. So he that in this action contrives against his own nobility, in his proper stream o'erflows himself. Is it not meant damnable in us to be trumpeters of our unlawful intents? We shall not then have his company to-night? Not till after midnight, for he is dieted to his hour. That approaches apace. I would gladly have him see his company anatomized, that he might take a measure of his own judgments, wherein so curiously he had set this counterfeit. We will not meddle with him till he come, for his presence must be the whip of the other. In the meantime, what hear you of these wars? I hear there is an overture of peace. Nay, I assure you, a peace concluded. What will Count Roussillon do then? Will he travel higher, or return again into France? I perceive by this demand you are not altogether of his counsel. Let it be forbid, sir. So should I be a great deal of his act. Sir, his wife, some two months since, fled from his house. Her pretense is a pilgrimage to St. Jacques le Grand, with holy undertaking, with most austere sanctimony she accomplished, and there residing the tenderness of her nature became as prey to her grief in fine made a groan of her last breath and now she sings in heaven how is this justified the stronger part of it by her own letters which makes her story true even to the point of her death her death itself which could not be her office to say is come was faithfully confirmed by the rector of the place hath the count all this intelligence Aye, and the particular confirmations, point from point, so to the full arming of the verity. I am heartily sorry that he'll be glad of this. How mightily sometimes we make us comforts of our losses. And how mightily some other times we drown our gain in tears. The great dignity that his valour hath here acquired for him shall at home be encountered with a shame as ample. The web of our life is of a mingled yarn, good and ill together. Our virtues would be proud if our faults whipped them not, and our crimes would despair if they were not cherished by our virtues. Enter a messenger. How now? Where's your master? He met the duke in the street, sir, of whom he hath taken a solemn leave. His lordship will next morning for France. The duke hath offered him letters of commendation to the king. They shall be no more than needful there, if they were more than they can commend. They cannot be too sweet for the king's tartness. Here's his lordship now. Enter Bertram. How now, my lord? Is it not after midnight? I have, to-night, dispatched sixteen businesses, a month's length apiece. By an abstract of success, I have conjured with the duke, done my adieu with his nearest, buried a wife, mourned for her, writ to my lady mother i am returning entertained my convoy and between these main parcels of dispatch effected many nicer needs the last was the greatest but that i have not ended yet if the business be of any difficulty and this morning your departure hence it requires haste of your lordship i mean the business is not ended as fearing to hear of it hereafter but shall we have this dialogue between the fool and the soldier come bring forth this counterfeit module he has deceived me like a double-meaning prophesier. Bring him forth. Has sat in the stocks all night, poor gallant knave. No matter. His heels have deserved it in usurping his spurs so long. How does he carry himself? I have told your lordship already. The stocks carry him. But to answer you as you would be understood, he weeps like a wench that had shed her milk. He hath confessed himself to Morgan, whom he supposes to be a friar, from the time of his remembrance to this very instant disaster of his setting of the stocks. And what think you he hath confessed? Nothing of me, has he? His confession is taken, and it shall be read to his face. If your lordship be int, as I believe you are, you must have the patience to bear it. Enter Parolles guarded, and first soldier. A plague upon him! Ah, muffled! 
He can say nothing of me. Hush, hush. Hoodman comes. Porto Tartarossa. He calls for the tortures. What will you say without them? I will confess what I know without constraint. If you pinch me like a pasty, I can say no more. Bosco Simarco. Bubbly Bindo. Chickamurco. You are a merciful general. Our general beats you answer to what I shall ask you out of a note. And truly, as I hope to live, reads. First demand of him how many horse the duke is strong. What say you to that? Five or six thousand, but very weak and unserviceable. Uh, the troops are all scattered, and the commander's very poor rogues. Upon my reputation and credit, and as I hope to live. Shall I set down your answer so? Do! I'll take the sacrament on it, how and which way you will. All's one to him. What a past saving slave is this? You're deceived, my lord. This is Monsieur Parros, the gallant militarist. That was his own phrase. That had the whole theoric of war in the knot of his scarf, and the practice in the shape of his dagger. I will never trust a man again for keeping his sword clean, nor believe he can have everything in him by wearing his apparel neatly. Well, that is said down. Five or six thousand horse, I said. I will say true, or thereabouts set down, for I'll speak truth. He's very near the truth in this. But I can't him no thanks for it in the nature he delivers it. Poor rogues, I pray you say. Well, that's set down. Oh, I humbly thank you, sir. A truth's a truth. The rogues are marvellous poor. <laughs> Reads. Demand of him of what strength they are afoot. What say you to that? By my troth, sir, if I were to live this present hour, I will tell true. Uh, let me see. Uh, Spurio, a hundred and fifty. Sebastian, so many. Uh, Corambus, so many. Uh, Jaquiz, so many. Giltian, Cosmo, Lodowick, and Gratii, two hundred and fifty each. Mine own company, Critifer, Vaumond, Bentii, two hundred and fifty each. So that the muster file, rotten and sound upon my life, amounts not to fifteen thousand pole. Half the which dare not shake snow from out their cassocks, lest they shake themselves to pieces. What shall be done to him? Nothing, but let him have thanks. Demand of him my condition, and what credit I have with the duke. Well, that's set down. Reads. You shall demand of him whether one Captain Dumain be in the camp a Frenchman. What his reputation is with the duke, what his valour, honesty, and expertness in wars, and whether he thinks it were not possible with well weighing sums of gold to corrupt him to revolt. What say you to this? What do you know of it? I, I beseech you, let me answer to the particular of the interrogatories. Demand them singly. Do you know this Captain Dumain? I know him. I was a butcher's prentice in Paris. From whence he was whipped for getting the shreve's fool with child, a dumb innocent that could not say him nay. Nay, by your leave, hold your hands, though I know his brains are forfeit to the next tile that falls. Well, is this captain in the Duke of Florence's camp? Upon my knowledge, he is. And lousy. <laughs> nay, look not so upon me. We shall hear of your lordship anon. What is his reputation with the Duke? The duke knows him for no other but a poor officer of mine, and writ to me this other day to turn him out of the band. I think I have his letter in my pocket. Mary, we will search. <laughs> in good sadness, I do not know. Either it is there, or it is upon a file with the duke's other letters in my tent. Here it is. Here is a paper. Shall I read it to you? <laughs> I do not know if it be or no. Our interpreter does it well. Excellently. Reads. Diane, the Count is a fool, and a fool of gold. Uh, that is not the Duke's letter, sir. That is an advertisement to a proper maid in Florence, one Diana, to take heed of the allurement of one Count Rousillon, a foolish idle boy, but for all that very ruttish. I, I pray you, sir, put it up again. Nay, I'll read it first by your favour. My meaning in it, I protest, was very honest in the behalf of the maid, for... I knew the young Count to be a dangerous and lascivious boy who is a whale to virginity and devours up all the fry it finds. 
damnable both sides rogue reads when he swears oaths bid him drop gold and take it after his scores he never pays the score half one is match well made match and will make it he never pays after debts take it before and say a soldier dian told thee this men are to mail it boys are not to kiss for count of this the count is a fool i know it who pays before but not when he does owe it time as he vowed to thee in thine ear parolles he shall be whipped through the army with this rhyme in his forehead this is your devoted friend sir the manifold linguist and the armipotent soldier i could endure anything before but a cat and now he's a cat to me i perceive sir by the general's looks we shall be fain to hang you my life sir in any case and not that i am afraid to die but that my offences being many i would repent out the remainder of nature let me live sir in a dungeon in the stocks or anywhere so i may live we will see what may be done so you confess freely therefore once more to this captain domain you have answered to his reputation with the duke and to his valour what is his honesty he will steal sir an egg out of a cloister for rapes and ravishments he parallels nessus he professes not keeping of oaths in breaking them he is stronger than hercules he will lie sir with such volubility that you will think truth were a fool drunkenness is his best virtue for he will be swine drunk and in his sleep he does little harm save to his bedclothes about him but they know his conditions and lay him in straw i have but little more to say sir of his honesty he has everything that an honest man should not have what an honest man should have he has nothing i begin to love him for this for this description of thine honesty a pox upon him for me he's more and more a cat what say you to his expertness in war faith sir he has led the drum before the english tragedians to belie him i will not and more of his soldiership i know not except in that country he had the honour to be the officer at a place there called mile end to instruct for the doubling of files i would do the man what honour i can but of this i am not certain he hath out villained villainy so far that the rarity redeems him pox on him he's a cat still his qualities being at this poor price i need not to ask you if gold will corrupt him to revolt sir for a court decue he will sell the fee simple of his salvation the inheritance of it and cut the entail from all remainders and a perpetual succession for it perpetually what's his brother the other captain to maine why does he ask him of me what is he in a crow with the same nest not altogether so great as the first in goodness but greater a great deal in evil he exceeds his brother for a coward yet his brother is reputed one of the best that is in a retreat he outruns any lackey marry in coming on he has the cramp if your life be saved will you undertake to betray the florentine ay and the captain of his horse count resilian <laughs> i'll whisper the general and know his pleasure aside i'm no more drumming a plague of all drums only to seem to deserve well and to beguile the supposition of that lascivious young boy the count have i run into this danger yet who would have suspected an ambush where i was taken there is no remedy sir but you must die the general says you that have so traitorously discovered the secrets of your army and made such pestiferous reports of man very nobly held can serve the world for no honest use therefore you must die Come, headsman, off with his head. O oh, Lord, sir, let me live, or let me see my death. That shall you, and take your leave of all your friends. Unblinding him. So, look about you. Know you any here? Good morrow, noble captain. God bless you, Captain Parolus. God save you, noble captain. Captain, what greeting will you to my lord Lefeu? I am for France. Good captain, will you give me a copy of the sonnet you writ to Diana in behalf of the Count Rousselon, 
and I were not a very coward, ill compel it of you. But fare you well. Exeunt Bertram and Lords. You are undone, Captain, all but your scarf. That has not aunt yet. Who cannot be crushed with a plot? If you could find out a country where but women, where dad had received so much shame, you might begin an impudent nation. Fare you well, sir. I am for France, too. We shall speak of you, dear. Exit with soldiers. Uh, yet I am thankful. If my heart were great, twould burst at this. Captain, I'll be no more, but I will eat and drink, and sleep as soft as captain shall. Simply the thing I am shall make me live. Who knows himself a braggart? Let him fear this, for it will come to pass that every braggart shall be found an ass. Rust, sword, cool blushes, and Parolus live safest in shame. Being fooled by foolery thrive. There's place and means for every man alive. I'll after them. Exit. Scene four. Florence, the widow's house. Enter Helena, widow, and Diana. That you may well perceive I have not wronged you, one of the greatest in the Christian world shall be my surety, for whose throne tis needful ere I can perfect mine intents to kneel. Time was I did him a desired office, dear almost as his life, which gratitude through flinty Tartar's bosom would peep forth and answer thanks. I duly am informed his grace is at Marseilles, to which place we have convenient convoy. You must know I am supposed dead, the army breaking, my husband hies him home, where heaven aiding, and by the leave of my good lord the king, will be before our welcome. Gentle madam, you never had a servant to whose trust your business was more welcome. Nor you, mistress, ever a friend whose thoughts more truly labour to recompense your love. Doubt not, but heaven hath brought me up to be your daughter's dower, as it hath fated her to be my motive and helper to a husband. But, oh, strange men, that can such sweet use make of what they hate, when saucy trusting of the cousined thoughts defiles the pitchy night, so lust doth play with what it loathes for that which is away. But more of this hereafter. You, Diana, under my poor instructions, yet must suffer something in my behalf. Let death and honesty go with your impositions. I am yours upon your will to suffer. Yet I pray you, but with the word the time will bring on summer, when briars shall have leaves as well as thorns, and be as sweet as sharp. We must away. Our wagon is prepared, and time revives us. All's well that ends well, still the find's the crown. Whate'er the course, the end is the renown. Exeunt. Scene five. Rossillon, the Count's Palace. Enter Countess, Lafeu, and Clown. No, no, no! Your son was misled with a snipped taffeta fellow there, whose villainous saffron would have made all the unbaked and doughy youth of a nation in his colour. Your daughter-in-law had been alive at this hour, and your son here at home, more advanced by the king than by that red-tailed humblebee I speak of. I would I had not known him. It was the death of the most virtuous gentlewoman that ever nature had praised for creating. If she had partaken of my flesh and cost me the dearest groans of a mother, I could not have owed her a more rooted love. Twas a good lady, twas a good lady. We may pick a thousand salads, ere we light on such another herb. Indeed, sir, she was the sweet marjoram of the salad or rather the herb of grace. They are not herbs, you knave. They are nose herbs. <laughs> I am no great Nebuchadnezzar, sir. I have not much skill in grass. Whether dost thou profess thyself, a knave or a fool? 
a fool, sir, at a woman's service, and a knave at a man's. Your distinction. I would cousin the man of his wife, and do his service. So you were a knave at his service, indeed. And I would give his wife my bauble, sir, to do her service. I will subscribe for thee. Thou art both knave and fool. At your service. No, no, no. Why, sir, if I cannot serve you, I can serve as great a prince as you are. Who's that? A Frenchman? Faith, sir, uh, has an English name, but his physiognomy is more hotter in France than here. What prince is that? The Black Prince, sir, alias the Prince of Darkness, alias the Devil. Hold thee, there's my purse. I give thee not this to suggest thee from thy master thou talkest of. Serve him still. I am a woodland fellow, sir, that always loved a great fire, and the master I speak of ever keeps a good fire. But sure, he is the prince of the world. Let his nobility remain in his court. I am for the house with the narrow gate, which I take to be too little for pomp to enter. Some that humble themselves may, but the many will be too chill and tender, and they'll be for the flowery way that leads to the broad gate and the great fire. Go thy ways. I begin to be aweary of thee, and I tell thee so before, because I would not fall out with thee. Go thy ways. Let my horses be well looked to, without any tricks. If I put any tricks upon em, sir, they shall be jades' tricks, which are their own right by the law of nature. Exit. A shrewd knave, and an unhappy. So he is. My lord that's gone made himself much sport out of him. By his authority he remains here, which he thinks is a patent for his sauciness. And indeed he has no pace, but runs where he will. I like him well, tis not amiss. And I was about to tell you, since I heard of the good lady's death, and that my lord your son was upon his return home, I moved the king my master to speak in the behalf of my daughter which in the minority of them both his majesty out of a self-gracious remembrance did first propose his highness hath promised me to do it and to stop up the displeasure he hath conceived against your son there is no fitter matter how does your ladyship like it with very much content my lord and I wish it happily effected. His Highness comes post from Marseille, of as able body as when he numbered thirty. He will be here to-morrow, or I am deceived by him that in such intelligence hath seldom failed. It rejoices me that I hope I shall see him ere I die. I have letters that my son will be here to-night. I shall beseech your lordship to remain with me till they meet together. Madam, I was thinking with what manners I might safely be admitted. You need but plead your honourable privilege. Lady, of that I have made a bold charter, but I thank my God it holds yet. Re-enter Clown. Oh, madam, yonder's my lord your son, with a patch of velvet on his face. Whether there be a scar under it, or no, the velvet knows. But tis a goodly patch of velvet. His left cheek is a cheek of two pile and a half, but his right cheek is worn bare. A scar nobly got, or a noble scar, is a good livery of honour. 
so belike is that but it is your carbonadoed face let us go see your son i pray you i long to talk with the young noble soldier faith there's a dozen of em with delicate fine hats and most courteous feathers which bow the head and nod at every man exeunt end of act four Act five of All's Well That Ends Well. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act five of All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare. Scene one. Marseille, a street. Enter Helena, widow, and Diana with two attendants. Oh, but this exceeding posting day and night must wear your spirits low. We cannot help it. But since you have made the days and nights as one to wear your gentle limbs in my affairs, be bold you do so grow in my requital as nothing can unroot you. In happy time. Enter a gentleman. This man may help me to his majesty's ear if he would spend his power. God save you, sir. And you. Sir, I have seen you in the court of France. I have been sometimes there. I do presume, sir, that you are not fallen from the report that goes upon your goodness, and therefore, goaded with most sharp occasions which lay nice manners by, I put you to the use of your own virtues, for the which I shall continue thankful. What's your will? That it will please you to give this poor petition to the King, and aid me with that store of power you have to come into his presence. The King's not here. Not here, sir? Not, indeed. He hence removed last night, and with more haste than is his use. Lord, how we lose our pains! Oh, all's well that ends well yet, though time seems so adverse and means unfit. I do beseech you, whither is he gone? Marry, as I take it, to Rousillon, whither I am going. I do beseech you, sir, since you were like to see the king before me, commend the paper to his gracious hand, which I presume shall render you no blame, but rather make you thank your pains for it. I will come after you with what good speed our means will make us means. This I'll do for you. And you shall find yourself to be well thanked, whate'er falls more. Ah, oh, we must to horse again. Go, go, provide. Exempt. Scene two. Rossillon before the Count's palace. Enter Clown and Parolles following. Ah, good Monsieur Labash, give my Lord Lefeu this letter. I have ere now, sir, been better known to you when I have held familiarity with fresher clothes, but I am now, sir, muddied in fortune's mood and smell somewhat strong of her strong displeasure. Truly, fortune's displeasure is but sluttish if it smells so strongly as thou speak'st of. I will henceforth eat no fish of fortune's buttering. Oof, pretty, allow the wind. Nay, you need not to stop your nose, sir. I speak but by a metaphor. Indeed, sir, if your metaphor stink, I will stop my nose, or against any man's metaphor. Prithee, get thee further. Pray you, sir, deliver me this paper. Oh, prithee, stand away. A paper from fortune's close stool to give to a nobleman. Hmm, look, here he comes himself. Enter a few. Here is a purr of fortune, sir, or of fortune's cat, but not a muscat, that has fallen into the unclean fish-pond of her displeasure, and, as he says, is muddied withal. Pray you, sir, use the carp as you may, for he looks like a poor, decayed, ingenious, foolish, rascally knave. Hmm, I do pity his distress in my similes of comfort, and leave him to your lordship. Exit. Uh, my lord, I am a man whom fortune hath cruelly scratched. 
and what would you have me to do tis too late to pare her nails now wherein have you played the knave with fortune that she should scratch you who of herself is a good lady and would not have knaves thrive long under her there's a carte de cue for you let the justices make you and fortune friends i am for other business i beseech your honour to hear me one single word you beg a single penny more come you shall hide it save your word my name my good lord is parolles you beg more than word then cox my passion give me your hand how does your drum oh my good lord you were the first that found me was i in sooth and i was the first that lost thee it lies in you my lord to bring me in some grace for you did bring me out out upon thee knave dost thou put upon me at once both the office of god and the devil one brings thee in grace and the other brings thee out trumpet sound the king's coming i know by his trumpets sirrah inquire further after me i had talk of you last night though you are a fool and a knave you shall eat go to follow i praise god for you exeunt scene three rossillon the count's palace flourish enter king countess lafeu the two french lords with attendants we lost a jewel of her and our esteem was made much poorer by it but your son as mad in folly lacked the sense to know her estimation home tis past my liege and i beseech your majesty to make it natural rebellion done in the blaze of youth when oil and fire too strong for reason's force o'erbears it and burns on my honoured lady i have forgiven and forgotten all though my revengers were high bent upon him and watched the time to shoot this i must say but first i beg my pardon the young lord did to his majesty his mother and his lady offence of mighty note but to himself the greatest wrong of all he lost a wife whose beauty did astonish the survey of richest eyes whose words all ears took captive whose dear perfection hearts that scorned to serve humbly called mistress praising what is lost makes the remembrance dear well call him hither we are reconciled and the first view shall kill all repetition let him not ask our pardon the nature of his great offence is dead and deeper than oblivion do we bury the incensing relics of it let him approach a stranger no offender and inform him so tis our will he should i shall my liege exit what says he to your daughter have you spoke all that he is hath reference to your highness then shall we have a match i have letters sent me that set him high in fame enter bertram i am not a day of season for thou mayst see a sunshine and a hail in me at once but to the brightest beams distracted clouds give way so stand thou forth the time is fair again my high repented blames dear sovereign pardon to me all is whole not one word more of the consumed time let's take the instant by the forward top for we are old and on our quickest degrees the inaudible and noiseless foot of time steals ere we can effect them you remember the daughter of this lord admiringly my liege at first i stuck my choice upon her ere my heart durst make too bold a herald of my tongue where 
the impression of mine eye in fixing contempt his scornful perspective did lend me which warped the line of every other favour scorned a fair colour or expressed it stolen extended or contracted all proportions to a most hideous object thence it came that she whom all men praised and whom myself since i have lost have loved was in mine eye the dust that did offend it well excused that thou didst love her strikes some scores away from the great comte but love that comes too late like a remorseful pardon slowly carried to the great sender turns a sour offence crying that's good that's gone our rash faults make trivial price of serious things we have not knowing them until we know they're grave oft our displeasures to ourselves unjust destroy our friends and after weep their dust our own love waking cries to see what's done while shame full late sleeps out the afternoon be this sweet helen's knell and now forget her send forth your amorous token for fair maudlin the main consents are had and here we'll stay to see our widower's second marriage day which better than the first o oh dear heaven bless or ere they meet in me o oh nature says come on my son in whom my house's name must be digested give a favour from you to sparkle in the spirits of my daughter that she may quickly come bertram gives a ring by my old beard and every hair that's on helen that's dead was a sweet creature such a ring as this the last that e'er i took her at court i saw upon her finger hers it was not now pray you let me see it for mine eye whilst i was speaking oft was fastened to it this ring was mine and when i gave it helen i bade her if her fortunes ever stood necessitated to help that by this token i would relieve her had you that craft to reave her of what should stead her most my gracious sovereign howe'er it pleases you to take it so the ring was never hers son on my life i have seen her wear it and she reckoned it at her life's rate i am sure i saw her wear it you are deceived my lord she never saw it in florence was it from a casement thrown me wrapped in a paper which contained the name of her that threw it noble she was and thought i stood engaged but when i had subscribed to mine own fortune and informed her fully i could not answer in that course of honour as she had made the overture she ceased in heavy satisfaction and would never receive the ring again plutus himself that knows the tinct and multiplying medicine hath not in nature's mystery more science than i have in this ring "'Twas mine, twas Helen's, whoever gave it you. "'Then if you know that you are well acquainted with yourself, "'confess twas hers, and by what rough enforcement you got it from her. "'She called the saints to surety that she would never put it from her finger, "'unless she gave it to yourself in bed where you have never come, "'or sent it us upon her great disaster. "'She never saw it! "'Thou speak'st it falsely.' as i love mine honour and makest conjectural fears to come into me which i would fain shut out if it should prove that thou art so inhuman twill not prove so and yet i know not thou didst hate her deadly and she is dead which nothing but to close her eyes myself could win me to believe more than to see this ring take him away guards sees bertram my forepast proofs howe'er the matter falls shall tax my fears of little vanity having vainly feared too little away with him we'll sift this matter further if you shall prove this ring was ever hers you shall as easy prove that i husbanded her bed in florence where yet she never was exit guarded i am wrapped in dismal thinkings 
Enter a gentleman. Gracious sovereign, whether I have been to blame or no, I know not. Here's a petition from a Florentine who hath for four or five removes come short to tender it herself. I undertook it, vanquished thereto by the fair grace and speech of the poor suppliant, who by this I know is here attending. Her business looks in her with an importing visage, and she told me in a sweet verbal brief it did concern your highness with herself. Reads. Upon his many protestations to marry me, when his wife was dead, I blush to say it he won me. Now is the Count Roussillon a widower, his vows are forfeited to me, and my honours paid to him. He stole from Florence, taking no leave, and I follow him to his country for justice. Grant it me, O king. He knew it best lies, otherwise a seducer flourishes, and the poor maid is undone. Diana Capulet. Ha! I will buy me a son-in-law in a fair, and toll for this. I'll none of him. The heavens have thought well on thee, Lafer, to bring forth this discovery. Seek these suitors. Go speedily, and bring again the count. I am afeard the life of Helen, lady, was foully snatched. Now justice on the doers. Re-enter Bertram, guarded. I wonder, sir, since wives are monsters to you, and that you fly them as you swear them, lordship, yet you desire to marry. Enter widow and Diana. What woman's that? I am, my lord, a wretched Florentine, derived from the ancient Capulet. My suit, as I do understand, you know, and therefore know how far I may be pitied. I am her mother, sir, whose age and honour both suffer under this complaint we bring, and both shall cease without your remedy. Come hither, Count. Do you know these women? My lord, I neither can nor will deny but that I know them. Do they charge me further? Why do you look so strange upon your wife? She is none of mine, my lord. If you shall marry, you give away this hand, and that is mine. You give away heaven's vows, and those are mine. You give away myself, which is known mine. For I, by vow, am so embodied yours, that she which marries you must marry me, either both or none. Your reputation comes too short for my daughter. You are no husband for her. My lord, this is a fond and desperate creature, whom some time I have laughed with. Let your highness lay a more noble thought upon mine honour, and for to think that I would sink it here. Sir, for my thoughts, you have them ill to friend, till your deeds gain them. Fairer prove your honour than in my thought it lies. Good my lord, ask him upon his oath if he does think he had not my virginity. What sayst thou to her? She's impudent, my lord, and was a common gamester to the camp. He does me wrong, my lord. If I were so, he might have bought me at a common price. Do not believe him. Oh, behold this ring, whose high respect and rich validity did lack a parallel. Yet for all that he gave it to a commoner of the camp, if I be one. He blushes, and tis it. Of six preceding ancestors, that gem conferred by testament to the sequent issue, hath it been owed and worn. This is his wife. That rings a thousand proofs. Methought you said you saw one here in court could witness it. I did, my lord, but loath am to produce so bad an instrument. His name's Parolus. I saw the man to-day, if man he be. Find him, and bring him hither. Exit an attendant. What of him? He's quoted for a most perfidious slave with all the spots of the world taxed and debauched, whose nature sickens but to speak a truth. Am I that or this for what he'll utter that will speak anything? She hath that ring of yours. I think she has. Certain it is, I, I liked her, and boarded her in the wanton way of youth. She knew her distance, and did angle for me. 
madding my eagerness with her restraint, as all impediments in fancy's course are motives of more fancy, and, in fine, her infinite cunning with her modern grace subdued me to her rate. She got the ring, and I had that which any inferior might at market-place have bought. I must be patient. You that have turned off a first so noble wife may justly die at me. I pray you yet, since you lack virtue, I will lose a husband. Send for your ring. I will return it home and give me mine again. I have it not. What ring was yours, I pray you? Sir, much like the same upon your finger. Know you this ring? This ring was his of late. And this was it I gave him, being a bed. The story then goes false. You threw it him out of a casement. I have spoke the truth. Enter Parolles. My lord, I do confess the ring was hers. You boggle shrewdly. Every feather stars you. Is this the man you speak of? Ay, my lord. Tell me, sirrah, but tell me true, I charge you, not fearing the displeasure of your master, which on your just proceeding I'll keep off. By him, and by this woman here, what know you? So please, your majesty, my master hath been an honourable gentleman. Uh, tricks he had in him, which gentlemen have. Come, come, to the purpose. Did he love this woman? Faith, sir, he did love her, but how? How, I pray you? He did love her, sir, uh, as a gentleman loves a woman. How is that? He loved her, sir, and loved her not. As thou art a knave and no knave, what an equivocal companion is this? He's a good drum, my lord, but a naughty orator. Do you know he promised me marriage? Faith, I know more than I'll speak. But wilt thou not speak all thou knowest? Yes, so please, your majesty. I, I did go between them, as I said, but more than that, he loved her. For indeed he was mad for her, and talked of Satan, and of Limbo, and of Furies, and I know not what. Yet I was in that credit with them at that time, that I knew of their going to bed, and of other motions, as promising her marriage, and things which would derive me ill-will to speak of. Uh, therefore I will not speak what I know. Thou hast spoken all already, unless thou canst say they are married. But thou art too fine in thy evidence, therefore stand aside. This ring, you say, was yours? I, my good lord. Where did you buy it, or who gave it you? It was not given me, nor I did not buy it. Who lent it you? It was not lent me neither. Where did you find it, then? I found it not. If it were yours by none of all these ways, how could you give it him? I never gave it him. This woman's an easy glove, my lord. She goes off and on at pleasure. This ring was mine. I gave it his first wife. It might be yours or hers for aught I know. Take her away. I do not like her now. To prison with her, and away with him. Unless thou tell'st me where thou hadst this ring, thou diest within the hour. I'll never tell you. Take her away. I'll put in bail, my liege. I think thee now some common customer. By Jove, if ever I knew man, t'was you. Wherefore hast thou accused him all this while? Because he's guilty, and he is not guilty. He knows I am no maid, and he'll swear to it. I'll swear I am a maid, and he knows not. Great king, I am no strumpet. By my life, I am either maid, or else this old man's wife. She does abuse our ears to prison with her. Good mother, fetch my bail. Stay, royal sir. Exit widow. The jeweller that owes the ring is sent for, and he shall surety me. But for this lord who hath abused me, as he knows himself, though yet he never harmed me, here I quit him. He knows himself my bed he hath defiled, and at that time he got his wife with child. Dead though she be, she feels her young one kick. So there's my riddle. One that's dead is quick. And now behold the meaning. Re-enter widow with Helena. Is there no exorcist beguiles the truer office of mine eyes? 
Is it real that I see? No, my good lord, tis but a shadow of a wife you see, the name and not the thing. Both. Both. Oh, pardon. Oh, my good lord, when I was like this maid, I found you wondrous kind. There is your ring. And look you, here's your letter. This it says, when from my finger you can get this ring, and you are by me with child, etc. This is done. Will you be mine, now you are doubly one? If she, my liege, can make me know this clearly, I'll love her dearly, ever, ever dearly. If it appear not plain and prove untrue, Deadly divorce step between me and you. Oh, my dear mother, do I see you living? Oh, mine eyes smell onions. I shall weep anon. To Parolles. Good Tom Drum, lend me a handkerchief. So, I thank thee. Wait on me home, I'll make sport with thee. Let thy courtesies alone, they are scurvy ones. Let us from point to point this story know, To make the even truth in pleasure flow. To Diana If thou beest yet a fresh uncropped flower, Choose thou thy husband, and I'll pay thy dower, For I can guess that by thy honest aid Thou keep'st a wife herself, thyself a maid of that and all the progress more or less resolvedly more leisure shall express all yet seems well and if it end so meet the bitter past more welcome is the sweet flourish the king's a beggar now the play is done all is well ended if this suit be won that you express content which we will pay with strife to please you, day exceeding day. Ours be your patience, then, and yours our parts. Your gentle hands lend us, and take our hearts. Excellent. End of Act 5 End of All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare